Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and author of the newly released book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned, Christian Guide to Healthy Intimacy. Nancy is a sex therapist, leadership coach, and licensed professional counselor. She is a director for the John Townsend Leadership Program in New York City and the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and an adjunct professor and fellow at the Townsend Institute at Concordia University. Before returning to private practice, Nancy was on staff at Gateway Church as an associate pastor in the Marriage and Family Department and founded the Intimate Life Department. She's an author, speaker, and teacher. She's been married to the love of her life since 1974. They have four married sons and eight grandchildren who delight them to no end. Nancy Houston, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Nancy, this is a subject that is just so important and so not spoken about. Uh, but I was moved in your introduction when you shared... Uh, what you entitled Through My Eyes, and I'm wondering if you'll share that with our audience. Uh, I'd be happy to, Eric. So I wrote, for nearly 20 years of my life, I've worked with beautiful humans who have struggled with their sexuality. I shed tears with those who've experienced the dark side of what God meant for good. I've helped those who lost hope and mostly created a safe place for women and men to find hope and healing. I've helped them to discover they too can experience a happy, playful, even erotic married sex life. This topic is more than just clinical for me. I too have walked through significant pain to find the joy in understanding and even claiming my sexuality as a valuable jewel of who I am as a person. I hope you'll do the same. Nancy, that is uh, poetic in its own way that this is a part of your journey, but it's also a part of all of our journeys. When you were growing up, your identity was being shaped, and it was being shaped by a view of parents and our generation, uh, public displays of affection, intimacy, the even thought. Um, and, and I, you know, I often joke that uh, Every Jewish mother uh, wants their son to pray to them. Every Jewish mother thinks their son is God. And every Jewish boy is led to believe his mother's a virgin. So this story in the Bible about Jesus it becomes kind of a, a, a play on words as we look at this image that we portray that intimacy and sex are carnal, uh, it's dirty, uh, it's something that is not a design of God. It's become perverted. It's become taboo. And then it's become uh, profiteered. It's become uh, an industry. And we've lost our perspective. How did you get called into uh, from your upbringing, from your background into this particular area that there is so little written about and so little spoken about? Well, I grew up in a non-Christian home, and my father was a World War II vet who, now I understand, I didn't understand this as a child, but he suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. He had been on three military ships that sank, and watched so many of his buddies drowned and um, be beaten to death on the rocks when they tried to climb ashore. And so my dad just grew up with trauma. And then after the military, he went back to riding bulls in the rodeo and, uh, you know, busted his head open pretty good and spent four months in the hospital. So he not only had post-traumatic stress disorder, but he also had a severe brain injury. And my dad was a brilliant man. He was a lawyer and he was the city judge. Um, so in so many ways, I had a lot of love and respect for him, but he was also totally unpredictable. And he drank a lot and partied, uh, partied and I believe he had affairs on my mother. And, you know, if we kind of, us kids kind of dug around, you could find some stacks of Playboy. And at his worst, he could also be sexually abusive to his own children. 
So I grew up in this um, very unpredictable home where there could be joyful things and we could have delightful privileges, but at other times it could be terrifying and traumatizing. So I married right out of high school to my high school sweetheart, felt safe for the first time in my life. Thank goodness I was blessed to marry a very safe man. Um, we both really committed our lives to the Lord and we love him with all of our hearts. And so when I got in my 30s, I really had to start working through my own personal trauma. I had tried to avoid that for <laughs> all during my 20s, like it'll go away, I forgive them, it's okay, it's over. Um, but it just really wasn't. So I had to do a lot of work on really healing my own trauma, um, getting help with that. Thankfully, I had this wonderful Christian counselor and he said, tell me your story. And when I did, he sat there and cried. I didn't, but he did. And he's like, oh my goodness, you have, you have post-traumatic stress disorder from your childhood. Um, and so I did a lot of recovery work. And then I um, just felt like God said to me, you, you need to get a master's degree in counseling. So I did, and I started in private practice. And before I knew it, my office was filled with men and women who had experienced either sexual trauma or their, their marriage, sexual sexuality in their marriage was not working for them. Maybe they would come in, I'd have women come in and say, I hate sex, I absolutely hate sex. And I'd say, well, tell me about that. There's a reason you hate sex, so let's unpack that. And I remember at the end of a very long day where I'd had eight clients just sitting on the sofa after everybody had gone home and just had some time to myself and saying, God, what is happening? I'm, I had no idea that so many of your children are struggling with their sexuality. And so I'm kind of like, is this what I'm going to do? <laughs> and if it is, I want more training. So that's when I did my postgraduate work at the Institute for Sexual Wholeness, which is this wonderful Christian organization where we really integrate our sexuality and our spirituality. And that's why I learned that that is so vital and that we humans don't do that because oftentimes we have all these shameful feelings about our sexuality. And so we kind of like, God, you're over here and my sex life is here and the two will never meet. And I think God is, you know, he cares about every detail of our lives. He he loves us. He's for us. And he knows that this is a complex area. And he really wants to help us and be integrated into our sexuality instead of separated and kept over in the corner. <laughs> you know, so I just pursued, like, how can I do this professionally? How can I really help people? And then as a pastor at a large church for five years, my goodness, again, my office just filled up with sexually broken people who love God, but are, are in so much pain in this area. So I am on a mission, really, to let's talk about it. Even if we don't have perfect conversations, let's start a dialogue on human sexuality. Let's make it safe. Let's try not to polarize you know, oftentimes we go, well, that's right, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong, instead of having healthy dialogues and how we can really help other people. And, you know, what I've discovered is that oftentimes just sexual education can help solve so many sexual problems. But unfortunately, for most people, especially now the world we live in, Porn is, is probably one of their biggest educators. In our day, it was kind of locker room talk, you know? And, and those were our experts. Well, those are lousy experts. And so we actually need to have education on this topic. We need to have healthy dialogues. We need to normalize. We are sexual creatures by God's design. It's not a glitch in our engineering. Um, God made us sexual creatures. Obviously, all you have to do is look at our anatomy and our physiology and our, you know, our hormones, and you realize, yes, we are sexual creatures, so let's kind of get over, <laughs> let's kind of get over that. Let's normalize it. 
and let's make it safe to talk about. When God created us in, as he says, in our image, we created them, both male and female. Uh, we were charged, uh, and in the Hebrew, we were charged with, we were blessed, we were commanded to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And this was done through a gift of procreation that God gave to us that created an intimacy that what became that honeymoon period where it was hormonal and it was it was almost automatic and there was uh, a certain tension uh, that was exciting and endorphins and then it seems for a lot of people that that then fades away and they don't realize that it's an area of their life that is important because it is part of the definition of what God's instruction for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they shall become one. If there is not the unity, if there is not that coming together, then there's still two. So they're, they're a house divided against itself and it cannot, it cannot succeed. Well, isn't God beautifully and wonderfully creative in how he designed all of this so that we would first experience strong attraction towards one another and that would move us into uh, a friendship and a relationship and then where there's actually like, I want to spend my life with you. And so then a covenant is made to do that. So God intended for us to have strong attachment, but I believe that marriage is meant to mature from, you know, this attraction, which doesn't take a whole lot of effort. It's, it, it's pretty much based on chemicals, these great feel, feel good chemicals. I call them the love drugs. And I'm like, how fun God that you gave us the love drugs. Now, most of us would like to exist our entire life on love drugs, but I think God, like kind of like everything, he wants us to mature in our relationships and go deeper. So I think he wants us to go from attraction to attachment. And actually, sexuality helps us do that. And that's why I'm such an advocate of if you're married, you know, stay sexual with each other. And it's not going to be automatic. It's after you've been married for a while, it's not going to be like the movies where you just want to rip your clothes off each other and have wild sex. I mean, that's just not practical. It moves more into a choice, a choice to be sexual, a choice to be close to each other, a choice to continue to bond through having sex. Because when we have sex, we release these bonding chemicals that help us stay attached to each other. And I really think that um, sex for a married couple is, is kind of like oil in the engine. You know, it, you know, there's times where I will ask women, well, so if you do choose to have sex with your husband, do you feel less annoyed with him <laughs> and he with you? And they're like, yeah, you know, after we have sex, it's kind of like, well, you're not so bad, are you? And I think we need that. And God knew that we were going to need that because just the differences in ma being male and female and doing life together day in and day out and paying bills and raising children and mowing the yard and keeping the kitchen clean and the laundry done can get sort of mundane and annoying. But here God gave us this one thing that is, is part mystery of how it bonds us as husband and wife together. It's, it's really beautiful, you know, how, how Scripture says, sex is more than skin on skin. It is a deep mystery. And so, you know, I just try to advocate for married couples, don't neglect this part of your life. And if you're having sexual problems or difficulties connecting, you're normal. About 60% of married couples are having a sexual problem right this minute. So, so that's normal. 
But don't make that a reason to give up on being sexual together. Instead, find ways to be sexual friends, find ways to build a bridge towards sexual pleasure, and keep working at it together. Don't just let it die. I'm telling you, at some point in your marriage, I've been married 43 years, at some point in your marriage, it will be real easy to just say, you know, there's too much trouble, let's just, let's just give up on it. But I also wanna tell you, it's worth fighting for. And I really think that God wants us to fight for it. It's, you know, anything worth having, we have to work at, right? And I think the world sells us this bill of goods that it's supposed to be easy, automatic, natural, it's just gonna happen. And that after you've been married for a while, that's just not the truth. You're gonna have to like, this is a high priority and we're gonna value this because God values it. And we're gonna keep working on it. And if we need to get help, we're gonna get some help. There's no shame in asking for help, right? Nancy, Everything you're saying is sound, reasonable, logical, rational, palatable, sounds like this is going to work. But we've turned into couples where love is used as a weapon. We have become manipulative by using the body or sexual intimacy as if I withhold it, I can get what I want. If I give it, then we have the wandering, the, the drifting. We have the environment where uh, we don't have an open line of communication. And in your book, you talk about a sexually satisfying marriage is based on a communication style of using this as one of the many communication tools that God gives us in order to cement. It's a part of the mortar. It's a part of the glue that keeps that cord of three strands from coming unraveled. We, we all have this beautiful picture of a cord of three strands. Well, we look at a rope and it's great. But if it's frayed on the end and we don't tend to it, it's easily unraveled and all of a sudden there it's laying in a pile and there's three strands. Okay? It's this cord. We keep thinking of three strands. No, the operative word is cord. It's a cord made of three strands that's not easily broken. It's not the three strands. It's, the, it's what it's made to hold together. And somewhere along the way, we got to the point where the honeymoon was over and now we have to get down to the practical and the mundane and I'm too tired and um, you you didn't respond well and Valentine's Day, you didn't do enough, you forgot our anniversary, you didn't. And then all of a sudden it becomes the, the, not, the nots and the didn'ts as opposed to finding the level of appreciation uh, the things in common and why it's healthy because <clears throat> if you're in abuse, an abusive relationship th that should last one more second That's true. Uh, if you are involved in pornography uh, you need it, it's a huge industry it's a huge problem it's widely available uh, if you are confused in your identity, uh, in who you are and how you are made, this is the kind of help that you offer in love and sex. This is not to replace going to counseling. This is clearly saying, listen, I need a framework. I have a framework for my, my kids. I get a calendar from school. Uh, and, and, and things are, are ordered, but I don't program in. I don't put on my calendar intimacy. I don't put on my calendar. I don't make it a priority. So if it's not on my to-do list, right, I don't get it done. Yeah. And what you're saying here is from a biblical 
perspective, not only does it need to be on the to-do list, but it never needs to be taken off of the to-do list. It's not a to-do. It's a to-want. It's to enjoy. It's to embrace. And it's part of God's design. And if we want to be intimate with God, He uses the things of the natural to show us that we're capable of being intimate with him, if I can't be intimate with my spouse, how can I claim to be intimate with God when in the natural I can't be intimate? How can I be intimate with the invisible and the supernatural if I can't be intimate with the natural? So it begs the question of our Christian walk of doing more for God or doing more with God, doing more for my spouse, or is this the intimate part that says I'm doing more with my spouse? It's learning how to be intimate is a challenge for all of us. I think, um, you know, sadly, because of the fall, we we start seeing um, naked and unashamed as the not normal <laughs> instead of the instead of the intended normal. And so we start hiding and operating out of shame. And really, when we start operating out of shame and fear, then we become controlling and manipulative. And, and sex does become a bartering tool, which is, is so sad. Um, one of the great advice we got when Ron and I got married is, don't ever use sex as a weapon. And what great advice was that? Because it can quickly become a weapon. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And that's not what sex was intended ever to do. It's meant to be an expression of the shared love that you have for one another. And really shared love is desiring the good of the other, wanting the best for the other. And it doesn't mean you sacrifice yourself completely for that because I think in a healthy relationship, you you want to love this person, you want to love yourself. And so you want the, the good for, for that person, you want the good for you. And I think sexuality is meant to be that. It's meant to be about pleasure. And then oxytocin is released for females. When, when a female goes skin to skin with her husband, oxytocin is starting, is released. And that's the bonding hormone. So she feels more connected to him. I really advocate, like, make time for non-sexual touch. A couple of times during the day, do a 60-second hug that is non-sexual and where you're going chest to chest, belly to belly, and that starts releasing some of those feel-good hormones, some of those bonding hormones um, that females need to release to feel safe, to feel attached, to feel like you're my man, it's safe for me to have sex with you, this isn't about duty sex, this isn't about your pleasure and my duty, because I think God totally refutes that idea and just how he made females. I mean, God gave females a sexual part that has no other purpose, it has no utilitarian purposes, except for female sexual pleasure. And I'm like, isn't God sweet? Because he's refuting this idea that oftentimes we women get in the religious world that this is for a man's pleasure and a wife's duty. And I'm like, if that's the case in your marriage, then uh, you kind of need to learn how to actually make love to each other. <laughs> um, because then sex is something that's just becoming automatic and, and a man, men are quicker sexually until they get older. And so maybe he's experiencing sexual pleasure and she's like, well, nothing happened for me. And we have to understand that females are different sexually. They're, they're as sexual as men are. They just have a different pathway to sexuality. And you know, when women get married for some reason, we have this idea that, our, that men are the sexual experts. And that just isn't true. A female needs to learn about her own body. She needs to understand what gives her pleasure, and she needs to be able to communicate that lovingly towards her husband, and not in a negative way, like, ooh, don't touch me like that, 
but more like, oh, when when you do this, it's really nice and it's really pleasurable. And and would you be willing to do this? And, and this makes me really happy. And you know, learning how to become sexual friends, where we're making it safe to have these kind of conversations with each other, and instead of becoming enemies or or bartering and if you give me this I'll give you this and if you don't give me this I'm gonna withhold this you know that just doesn't work in any relationship and intimacy is all about being naked and unashamed learning how to become emotionally vulnerable emotionally open connecting with one another you know oftentimes I think one of the things that builds intimacy is like even simple things like just praying together you know, just building that spiritual intimacy and connection to each other and asking each other throughout the day, like, hey, what do you need? How can I help you have a better day? How can I come alongside of you? You know, so you're talking about touch points. You're talking you about if you want a relationship with something, you have to have touch points. You have to have points of connection. Uh, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about a lamp. Uh, I have in my study a lamp that has three separate shades. It's kind of curved, and I have the choice of turning one on, two on, or all three on, depending on the lighting that I want. But if it's not plugged into the wall, I can spend all day turning that switch, and nothing will happen unless the connection is made and the source of power is made. And what you're talking about are touch points, touch points that are both biblical, praying together, touch points that are natural, which is uh, the need for human touch. We are given a need. It's, it's not a desire, it is a need. Uh, human contact. He created us for community, for fellowship, for relationship. Uh, we can't have an intimate relationship with God if we don't have touch points with God. You know, if, if, if you and your husband haven't spoken in 43 years, but you've stayed married, how would you define that marriage? You would call it a job, and you are looking for the retirement package that comes at the end of a 43-year employment contract that says, okay, I should be getting this much income and support, and I should get all these things that come along with the service I've performed for these 43 years. So this m misconception, or maybe even lack of a conception of all, or a framework that there is none, that we've so avoided this topic of love and sex from a Christian biblical perspective that we have a framework for conflict resolution. We have a framework for parenting, uh, for how we're going to divide responsibilities. We just don't have a framework and we're not intentional when it comes to the area of love and sex from a biblical perspective. And because of that, this is where we start seeing abuse, pornography, confusion, affairs, and all the things that are tearing 50% or more of Christian homes apart. Is they're looking for something somewhere else that they're not getting at home. Absolutely. And, you know, we are imitators. It, we just are. And I think because the Christian world has been so silent on this topic, I mean, thankfully, there, there are a few great Christians doing some really good work on this topic. But by and large, it, it's such a small segment. And we've been so silent on this topic or felt so much uncomfortability talking about it that actually because of our silence, people are becoming imitators of what the world offers. And, you know, the world says, view porn, why wouldn't you? It's arousing. It's pleasurable. It gives you instant gratification, which, you know, we live in a world that loves instant gratification. And sadly, the world doesn't say, oh, but let us warn you that porn is going to damage your prefrontal cortex. 
that porn is going to do damage to the relational center of your brain and your heart. And it's going to impact how you view your sexuality. And it's going to be dehumanizing to, to everyone, to, you know, the person viewing it and to the people whom you're in relationship with, it will change your sexual appetites. We have to realize that our sexuality needs to be discipled just like absolutely everything else in our lives. And the world says to us, well, you're pretty helpless about your sexuality. It just kind of happens to you. And, you know, hopefully it'll go fairly good, but it might not. And, you know, you're just born the way you are. And instead of going, no, this is something that was wired by our parents. We were wired sexually by our parents, by our family of origin. We were wired how we view relationships. We were wired how we interpret love. What is, what is love? We were wired to um, either share our bodies or not share our bodies, depending on how our parents potty trained us, believe it or not. We were wired to um, either feel extremely comfortable with our bodies or we were wired to feel very shameful and dirty about our bodies. And so like anything else, when we become believers, we, we need to bring our sexuality to God and say, okay, God, let's take a look at how this was wired. And maybe this was wired in a way that has nothing to do with you, God. I mean, my wiring had nothing to do <laughs> with anything biblical. And so God and I had to really sort that out and I had to get help in rewiring all of that so that I could have a life-giving view on human sexuality. And it could be a joyful part of my 43-year-old marriage. And thankfully, I married a man who, when I was working through some of my own sexual trauma, if we were making love and I would get triggered, I could just say, I am so triggered right now. And he would just hold me and pray for me, which communicated to me that I am with a safe man. He is, he is not here to just take something from me. He's here to partner with me. And, you know, I think a, a big part of marriage is creating safety. Like, I'm for you and I'm with you. And this goes for women with men. We women have to understand that when we make love to our husband, it does something for his soul. It goes deep inside of him. It helps him go out and face his world and conquer his enemies and gives him a sense of being loved and feeling wanted. And men want those things just as bad as, as men, as women do. They, they want to feel pursued. You know, we read the song of Solomon and it starts out with the woman saying, kiss me, kiss me full on the lips. You know, she is pursuing him. She's adoring him. She's, admiring his body and his beauty, just like he's admiring her body and her beauty. You know, it's this mutual feast of admiration and celebration and pleasure. And there's nothing there about duty sex or um, this is a job that I'm fulfilling or this is something I'm bartering with. And when they have those moments, you know, they call them the foxes, which we all have to deal with, don't we? but they deal with it. And where so many couples don't wanna deal with the hard things and they don't wanna have the hard conversations. And that's why in Love and Sex, I, I talk about all the hard stuff. I, I have created stories, so hopefully it will be safe for all of us when we're reading this book to go, oh, I identify with this character. Oh, I identify with her. Oh, I identify with him. And, and then I model how we work through our sexual issues because we all have them. We all have them. We can either feel like I'm entitled to sex or I'm entitled to this and you know, entitlement doesn't help any of us. <laughs> Humility helps all of us where we go, you know what God, I don't know how to love this man you gave me. Would you teach me how to make love to him? Would you teach me how to make love to her? Would you, would you teach me how to humble myself and be a student of this person instead of maybe trying to be more like a missionary where I'm trying to convince you that my way is the best way. <laughs> Nancy, have, have we 
so allowed the image of perfection to interfere with uh, what we think of our own bodies. I need to lose weight. Uh, I don't like my hips. I don't like my legs. I don't like my neck. I don't like this. And so I, because I don't feel good about me, I don't want to show, I, I'm projecting that. And so if he touches me, he's going to touch me in a place that I'm uncomfortable with that part of my body and so I don't even want to get in, undressed in front of my husband or my wife. I don't even want them in the same, don't, oh don't walk in on me, this is, this is my time. And we've created these boundaries that aren't boundaries at all, they're walls. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at, at, at uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and this is the first time this has ever occurred to me, that we use this as the model of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails, and sex is not mentioned at all in any aspect of this, and everybody's model, deck, the plaque on their wall is 1 Corinthians 13, their model for their marriage is 1 Corinthians 13, everybody wants the Proverbs 31 wife, they forget that she had a Proverbs 31 husband that had to be performing on, firing on all cylinders for her to even be so set apart that he had to be doing his job for her to be esteemed in the community, imagine the life and times in which this is written and created. Uh, I read a book um, called In Search of the Proverbs 31 Man because I thought what an interesting concept. We adore this Proverbs 31 woman. Every woman aspires to be this, but there is no role model that we look like, uh, you know, I want to be the, like Joseph, you know, I want to be separated from my family for 25 years and punished. No. Where do we find the role model for the, for the husband, the one who has to stay married to the prostitute? You know, where are we going to find this, this role model? Um, we, we look at, at Rahab and, and she gives birth to Boaz. Well, yeah, I want my Boaz. I really want my Boaz. Okay, so you want your mother-in-law to be a prostitute. You got to connect all the dots, and so we, we we don't look at it this framework. We don't have this good solid framework because we don't have good solid teaching. That's true. That's and so, so true. people love to read the Bible, and we talked about this offline before, and get the check mark of of our congregation. We have 100 percent participation, and everybody read through the Bible in a year. Okay, but our marriages aren't perfect. Our lives aren't a reflection of Messiah and the intimacy that we so desire. And there's a difference between love and lust, uh, but you can have lust in your marriage for your spouse and that's healthy. Lust outside the marriage is unhealthy. So we preach against lust outside the marriage uh, and love in the marriage, and we've separated them out as if I can't have this physical desire for my spouse. I can't have this uh, quote-unquote carnal pleasure within the bounds of marriage because somehow that that puts it in another category. But that's not true at all. That's a lie we've bought into and we perpetuate that and now we're in this situation where we're finding the divorce rate and the affair rate and now all of these sexual abuse claims are coming out and now it's becoming, and, and I, I hate to call it vogue or trend, but, but people are now, there's a safe place that's finally been created and we realize it is an epidemic, and it's an epidemic because we are 
absolutely, completely illiterate when it comes to the concept of love and sex, a Christian guide to healthy intimacy. Because the resources, I mean, think about it. I can't even think of a single denomination that would endorse denominationally that a pastor should devote in his messages on marriage, he would include the discussion of sex from the pulpit. Um, one of my board members is a district superintendent of the United Methodist Church. He and I are best friends. When we finish the program, I'm going to call him and ask him what would happen in, the, in his, his region if he introduced this concept and said, now when you preach on marriage and you preach on love and you preach on 1 Corinthians 13, which is probably part of their annual preaching cycle, I want you to add the component of sex, uh, biblical sexual intimacy into your message. I, w I want to get his response to that because he and I have these dialogues about how do we break the paradigm? How do we break the preconceived? How do we shatter the tradition? I came to faith as a Jewish man at 44. All right, 22 years ago, I came to faith in Jesus as my Messiah. So I believe every word that's in the Bible. I'm not smart enough not to believe every single word. And he created this intimate design, and it was designed to maintain unity. It wasn't to create unity, it was created, it was to establish unity and then maintain unity. And we forget that maintenance part. We look at the creation part, but we forget the maintenance part. Uh, our bodies do decay. I, I am driving a 60, 60 year old vehicle. Right? If my car was built in, the car I drove to work every day was built in 1952 like I was, right? it would require a whole lot of maintenance, a whole lot of work, a whole lot of, but God has, has still established in us um, testosterone and, and estrogen and, and natural hormones that keep us where we have an over 80 year old woman in the Bible who has been barren for over 80 years conceives a child. I, that didn't happen through osmosis. No, it didn't. And we celebrate the story of the birth of Isaac, the firstborn Jewish child. In all of history, the very firstborn child Jewish is Isaac. And that begins the lineage to our Messiah. And we celebrate that. They had to be intimate. All right? Here's this 100-year-old man <laughs> with this elderly, barren woman. And he's still able to perform adequately to conceive with the help of God. Don't we require the help of God in all of our areas of our life? Wouldn't that be sweet if we integrated him into our sexuality and integrated even his word into our sexuality? Like, I love to meditate on, on 1 Corinthians 13 and, and even think about, well, how does that apply to my sexual relationship with my husband? You know, if I really believe that that sex means so much deeper to him than I will probably other, ever understand and how can I love him well and patiently and kindly? You know, you start integrating these things and you stop um, a polarizing. Mm -hmm. You know, some believe that sex is, uh, you know, too lustful to be considered holy. And yet that's so not true because God is the one who gave us the capacity to enjoy erotic sexual passion. So, God's not the one with the hang-ups. We are the ones with the hang-ups. <laughs> I don't think God has sexual hang-ups. <laughs> I, I right. think we are the ones with all the hang-ups. You know, when you think about this, we're, we're created in the image of God, in His likeness. Therefore, our body parts, our 
systems, mm -hmm. the autonomic, the non-autonomic, the erotic, the non-erotic, all that are created by God in his image. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do a lot of things, but when it comes to intimacy, this right and wrong, uh, it, it's not a debate, it's not an argument, it's finding what uniquely every couple, it will look different for every couple. Their rhythm is different than anybody else's rhythm. And when God unites them, they are charged with creating and maintaining. Yes. We yes. always do the premarital counseling, uh, and there are certain things that we check off on these boxes. I'm getting ready to start a new couple soon, and uh, uh, I may even start here, as opposed to this is the finishing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because it becomes so important. Uh, it, it really and, is. It's so important that God decided to take the man and the woman, and, and they're they're one, and he he separates them. And sexual unity is, is how we create. That's part of the oneness. I don't think it's all of the oneness, but I do think that's a big part of the oneness. And when we're enjoying pleasure together, then we are being so bonded and attached, and that helps us maintain this relationship that's so vital and so important. So I'd love for us to stop polarizing and go, you know, sex actually is very holy. It's very sacred. It's God could have made us completely mechanical in how we reproduce, but he decided to make it pleasurable, erotic. And I would love for us to take the focus off of pressure, you know, all the commercials, every the way the world market sets, it's all about performance and pressure. And that doesn't create a happy sex life. I think we have to take the pressure off and focus on how can I as a wife give, give my husband pleasure and receive pleasure and, and how can he give me pleasure and he receive pleasure. And when that becomes our focus, then you know we stop trying to perform and we start relaxing accepting our bodies you brought up this point a while ago about body image you know women can think oh he just touched my muffin top and oh that's going to gross him out and he's like not even thinking about that right he's thinking about oh my goodness i'm just enjoying your beautiful body and i love your curves and i love that you're soft and you're beautiful to me and i've discovered that my husband's way less critical of my body than i am and I need to just let that go and just go, you know, this, it isn't about that. I'm, you know, sadly, porn says that women should look like supermodels and that men look like supermodels. And in the real world, nobody looks like that. They've all been photoshopped. And so we're sold this bill of goods that, you know, set, great sex is about having great bodies. So I'm like, no, it's not. It's really not. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's way more than skin on skin. It's so much deeper. Nancy, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We could talk about this for hours because nobody's talking about it. Uh, we're not devoting enough television time. We're not devoting enough pulpit time. We're not dividing, devoting enough Bible study time to something that we almost consider to be taboo to talk about in church, which is sex. Uh, we're to leave that out of the equation when we were actually created for it. Uh, and charged with it as a gift from God that we've now taken out of this biblical equation. We need to put it back into the biblical equation, and it is for marriage. It is for married couples. And, and so I want to make that very clear that my biblical position and your biblical position is, is that sex is for married, a man to a woman, a woman to a man, uh, in the traditional biblical sense definition of what marriage is to be and sex within the bounds of marriage. We've been talking with Nancy Houston, author of Love and Sex, A Christian Guide to Healthy Intimacy. Uh, a fabulous book, a subject that is so important and really may very well be at the core of a great 
high percentage of the problems in so many marriages today. I can't even give a number, but I would say at least 50, 60, 70 percent of marriages, this is an issue either spoken or unspoken. It is an area of uncertainty, and you bring a tremendous amount of clarity, compassion, understanding, and equipping within the pages of this book. Nancy Houston, thank you so much for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. God bless you. And that brings an end to our live broadcast day, but that doesn't mean we go off the air. We rebroadcast every one of these episodes five more times today, so we hit every time zone around the world with every one of our programs. And then you'll find us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on our WNDTV feed. You can find us always at ignitinganation.com. Look at the upcoming guests. Follow us here. Come back tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Central Time, right here in Birmingham, Alabama, live from our studios here. We will see you back tomorrow with another lineup of great guests. Until we see you here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, we bid you shalom.